This is section 25.7, the electromagnetic spectrum. We saw before that uh, electromagnetic waves can be generated by moving electrons up, up and down. And depending on what is the frequency of that motion, the wave will hang, we have a certain frequency. The relationship between the frequency and the wavelength is given by means of this relationship here, where C is the speed of light, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And so whenever the frequency increases, the wavelength decreases, given that this velocity in uh, the speed of light in air or in vacuum is constant. The energy of the wave is proportional to the frequency by means of uh, the energy being equal to H, Planck's constant, times the frequency and uh, consequently depending on what frequency um, it is used to produce the, the waves the wavelength will adjust so radio waves for instance have um, very long wavelengths but uh, very tiny frequencies or very small energies gamma rays on the other hand they have very high energies consequently they have uh, very short wavelengths. Again, all the electromagnetic waves are produced by the motion of the charges. Here we have on this side, we have uh, the energy, which would be the frequency times uh, Planck's constant, H, and this is the wavelength. It goes from hundreds of meters for radio waves all the way to 10 times uh, 10 to negative 10 meters for the more, most energetic um, electromagnetic waves, which are the gamma rays. In this movie, we're gonna see that we are bombarded by electromagnetic radiation from all types. Something surrounds you, bombards you, some of which you can't see, touch, or even feel. Every day, everywhere you go, it is odorless and tasteless, yet you use it and depend on it every hour of every day. Without it, the world you know could not exist. What is it? Electromagnetic radiation. These waves spread across a spectrum from very short gamma rays to X-rays ultraviolet rays, visible light waves, even longer infrared waves, microwaves, to radio waves which can measure longer than a mountain range. This spectrum is the foundation of the information age and of our modern world. Your radio, remote control, text message, television, microwave oven, even a doctor's x-ray, all depend on waves within the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic waves, or EM waves, are similar to ocean waves in that both are energy waves. They transmit energy. EM waves are produced by the vibration of charged particles and have electrical and magnetic properties. But unlike ocean waves that require water, EM waves travel through the vacuum of space at the constant speed of light. EM waves have crests and troughs like ocean waves. The distance between crests is the wavelength. While some EM wavelengths are very long and are measured in meters, many are tiny and are measured in billionths of a meter, nanometers. The number of these crests that pass a given point within one second is described as the frequency of the wave. One wave, or cycle, per second is called a hertz. Long EM waves, such as radio waves, have the lowest frequency and carry less energy. Adding energy increases the frequency of the wave and makes the wavelength shorter. Gamma rays are the shortest, highest energy waves in the spectrum. So, as you sit watching TV, not only are there visible light waves from the TV striking your eyes, but also radio waves transmitting from a nearby station, and microwaves carrying cell phone calls and text messages, and waves from your neighbor's Wi-Fi, and GPS units in the cars driving by. There is a chaos of waves from all across the spectrum passing through your room right now. 
With all these waves around you, how can you possibly watch your TV show? Similar to tuning a radio to a specific radio station, our eyes are tuned to a specific region of the EM spectrum and can detect energy with wavelengths from 400 to 700 nanometers, the visible light region of the spectrum. Objects appear to have color because EM waves interact with their molecules. Some wavelengths in the visible spectrum are reflected and other wavelengths are absorbed. This leaf looks green because EM waves interact with the chlorophyll molecules. Waves between 492 and 577 nanometers in length are reflected and our eye interprets this as the leaf being green. Our eyes see the leaf as green but cannot tell us anything about how the leaf reflects ultraviolet, microwave or infrared waves. To learn more about the world around us, scientists and engineers have devised ways to enable us to see beyond that sliver of the EM spectrum called visible light. Data from multiple wavelengths help scientists study all kinds of amazing phenomena on Earth, from seasonal change to specific habitats. Everything around us emits, reflects, and absorbs EM radiation differently based on its composition. A graph showing these interactions across a region of the EM spectrum is called a spectral signature. Characteristic patterns, like fingerprints within the spectra, allow astronomers to identify an object's chemical composition and to determine such physical properties as temperature and density. NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope observed the presence of water and organic molecules in a galaxy 3.2 billion light years away. Viewing our sun in multiple wavelengths with the SOHO satellite allows scientists to study and understand sunspots that are associated with solar flares and eruptions harmful to satellites, astronauts, and communications here on Earth. We are constantly learning more about our world and universe by taking advantage of the unique information contained in the different waves across the EM spectrum. This uh, video is going to show uh, the So this is a typical electromagnetic, electromagnetic wave. wave as proposed by Maxwell. We've got three dimensions. We've got the x-axis that goes along in this direction. That's actually the direction of the electromagnetic wave. We've got the y-axis and of course uh, the third dimension is the z axis. And of course the electric field is represented by red. So you can see that this, this red field is perpendicular to the x-axis and it's uh, of course it, like a sine wave it goes uh, above and then it goes below. So we have crests and troughs. At the same time that the electric field is being generated there's also a perpendicular magnetic field being generated in the blue. And those two are perpendicular and they, as one gets bigger the other one gets bigger. As one gets smaller the other gets smaller. And so we have both perpendicular electric and magnetic fields and notice that the uh, z-axis which carries the uh, magnetic field and the, X and the y axis which carries the um, the electric field are both perpendicular to the direction of propagation of the wave. Waves are produced by means of uh, motion of charges and if they can be generated by an antenna represented here by this generator and these uh, conductors. As this wave produces a current, the, the, the charges can come this way and then they can move up and they can move down and in doing so they will generate uh, the electric field up and down and the magnetic field in and out into the page. This is only a representation because in, as a matter of, uh, in, in fact the electric field can be pointing in any direction. So just like the waves are, rep are generated by this antenna, they can also be uh, detected by means of the similar, uh, similar uh, arrangement by similar antenna. Um, a drawing here in which uh, we have two conductors that uh, when the wave comes in will make the electrons move up and down and this 
is going to be, in this case, this is the source of the current. So this one is producing the antenna, but um, this one is receiving the, that's producing the wave. And this one is receiving the wave as the wave comes in, makes the electrons move up and down. And that signal is being collected and amplified. Um, the um, electric field that is produced the, by the wave times the distance will give you the voltage that you're generating between the ends of the antenna. This is uh, the, uh, a uh, demonstration of how the dipole antenna works. We have a power source. We have uh, the transmitter and we have the transmitting antenna. And we have a receiving antenna. When uh, it is turned on, it is producing waves and it has a, a light bulb there that switches off when it's not collecting radiation and it switches on when it is receiving radiation. To receive radiation, it has to be aligned in the, in the same direction as the, um, as the wave coming in. The wave coming in is uh, along the horizontal. When this is vertical, there is no wave being received. There is another type of antenna, which is the magnetic dipole antenna. Most likely you have seen devices like this. The rabbit ear uh, rods here are to pick up the electric field of the waves, whereas the loop is the one used to receive the magnetic field, to detect the magnetic field of the wave. This uh, represents a wave um, going into the paper and as it moves in, produces a flux in this uh, area. And the wave, since it is oscillating because it's being uh, produced by an uh, electromagnetic wave, the, um, the flux is gonna be changing. And in doing so, it will induce a current that will flow in one direction and then the opposite direction, picking up the signal through the, the oscillations of the magnetic field. That signal goes to the amplifier and it can be used to um, transmit the, the signal. The um, flux, of course, is given by the field times the area and the sign in this case is the oscillation that varies as a function of time. So this variation is gonna give you the um, the EMF that is being produced. So all together is gonna to be given by this expression where all of this factor in front is gonna be the maximum value of the voltage of the EMF. So the e EMF maximum value is gonna be given the number of turns of the coil times the field times the area times the angular frequency, which is uh, the number of uh, oscillations per unit time times two pi. This is one question. Uh, how would you, if you wanted to collect the receive this, the signal through the electric field, how would you place the antenna? Would you place it like this? Or in the case that the field is uh, on this plane, would you, do you think that this antenna would collect, would receive the signal? And of course, the answer is that you have to place it like this because the oscillations are in the vertical direction. So this has to be vertical in order to receive the, the signal. In the case of a loop, we have the loop oriented like in this plane, like in the plane where the electric field is in this case, and the, the magnetic field is uh, transverse to the loop. And we have another case in which the magnetic field is up and down and in the same, on the same plane as the, the loop. And the question is which of these two arrangements would pick up a signal through the magnetic field? And of course, the answer is this one because what you need is for the electric field to penetrate the loop. So if it's um, 
on this plane, it will go in and out, changing the flux and picking up the signal. Whereas in this case, the field is up and down and it will not penetrate the loop, will not produce any flux and the flux will not be changing. So it will not induce a current. This is the same type of, uh, of example in which the loop is here and you can see the field going uh, out in this case, but as a function of time, it will be reversing and going in. So um, the, the question is how sh should you orient a coil antenna to detect the oscillating magnetic field of the wave? Well, it has to be uh, perpendicular to the field, the coil has to be perpendicular to the field in order to have a flux, a changing flux. This is used in microwaves. In microwaves, uh, the way they work is that we're going to have the oscillating electric field moving up and down. And um, we tend to use microwaves to heat up uh, food. And food tends to have uh, water molecules inside. So the water molecule is polarizable in the sense that it's one oxygen and two hydrogens and um, the charges get distributed on one side, tends to be more positive than in the, on the other side. So when the field is pointing up, this will make the molecule orient in this direction. When it reverses, it will make the molecule orient in the opposite direction. So as the wave passes by, the molecule is going to be switching from this position to that position and back to this one and back to that one. And in doing so, we'll pick up heat, we'll pick up energy that will uh, heat up uh, the, the food. There's another type of uh, radiation, like for instance, uh, when atoms are vibrating, they can produce, um, they vibrate very rapidly because they are so small and they can produce waves that, are, that have high frequencies, like for instance, infrared, visible light, and UV, ultraviolet. Infrared, for instance, is produced by uh, our uh, cells, with the motion of our molecules in our cells, so we irradiate in the infrared. Ne uh, all the infrared, visible, and UV is uh, due to the motion of atoms. We have um, a relationship between the, uh, the heat that is being uh, radiated as a function of per unit time and the temperature of the object. Turns out that it goes like temperature to the fourth power. And uh, this constant here is the emissivity of um, the object that we are dealing with. And it is, uh, this is the emissivity, the E, and this other object is the Stefan Boltzmann constant given here by this number. This can be seen that um, if we increase the temperature and of course the energy, the brightness of the light bulb uh, increases. We have <clears throat> as, it, uh, as the filament warms up, it's going to go from this color to this one and then to that one. So the spectrum of thermal radiation changes with the temperature. This is another relationship that if you have a, a body at a given temperature, it will be radiating mostly, it will be radiating in a wide uh, range of frequencies or wavelengths, but um, the peak will depend on the temperature of the object. So for instance, if you have something that is uh, at uh, 3500 um, Kelvin, it will be peaking, the maximum frequency is gonna be here which is on the UV side. And if we increase the temperature all the way to 5,500, we're gonna have a peak here in, middle, in the middle of the visible light. And this is more or less the temperature of our uh, sun. The relationship between the, the wavelength of the peak and the temperature is given by means of this, is the inversely proportional temper the, to the temperature. As T increases, the wavelength becomes smaller as you can see here this is cooler 3500 Kelvin this is hotter 5500 Kelvin and this one has uh, a smaller wavelength than this one so going like the inverse of, uh, of the temperature and it has to be multiplied times that uh, constant this is an example 
what are the wavelengths of peak intensity for radiating objects at uh, the body temperature of 37 degrees? Well, first we have to put 37 degrees in Kelvin, so we add the 273, the temperature happens to be uh, 310. So we come to our previous expression and we see that um, the wavelength of the peak is going to begin by the constant divided by 310, so it's going to be 9.4 micrometers. Quick check, we have a brass plate at 300 Kelvin radiating 10 watts of energy. If the temperature is raised to 600 Kelvin, then it will radiate what would be the power. So the answer again is that it goes proportional to T to the four. So by it doubling this is going to increase four times. So uh, it's gonna, uh, actually it's gonna go, it, it, it's gonna go, uh, it will increase time, uh, times two to the fourth. And uh, it's gonna go from 10 to 160 watts. Uh, different question, if the temperature is increased again, uh, the wavelength of maximum radiating intensity will increase, decrease, remain the same, etc. Well, uh, we know that as the temperature increases, the wavelength decreases. So the answer is decreases because it goes like the inverse of the temperature. We have um, cells that detect light, but we different type. We have different types of uh, cells that, that that have uh, sensitivity for different wavelengths. Those are the so-called uh, cones. And we have uh, three types of cones, and they, one can detect more the red, one can detect more the, uh, this is the wavelength here, the green, and the other one more the, the blue. And um, w not all the animals have the same type of uh, cones. Uh, some animals, like the chickens, etc., they have uh, different types of cones and they can see things in a different um, from a different point of view like for instance this is the snake the viper can de detect infrared radiation so they can see us in the night because of our own emission and they can see for instance this Mickey Mouse here as a glowing uh, orange we go into other types of um, radiation like x-rays and gamma rays those have carry um, a higher energy which means that the frequency is higher and the, um, the wavelength is um, uh, way smaller the source of x-rays and gamma rays given that the wavelength is so, so small uh, it has to come from uh, it has to be produced by an object that is also very small and they tend to be uh, for instance, for X-rays, the atoms, and for gamma rays, the nuclei. And um, the X-rays can be produced in different ways, but um, we basically have two, two methods for producing um, the X-rays. One is by accelerating a bunch of electrons that collide with a metallic target, and they uh, slow down very rapidly when they hit the target. And in doing so, they radiate energy, and the energy comes in uh, uh, as x-rays. We have um, the, this is also called ionizing radiation because uh, x-rays and gamma rays are, can be produced by uh, affecting the electrons or the charges that are in the nucleus, the electrons in the atoms or the charges in the nucleus. And when uh, atoms lose energy, they are ionized. So when an X-ray passes by, it can ionize, and in doing so, deposits a lot of energy. And then, of course, those those electrons that are kicked out, they they come back, or or new electrons are trapped by the atoms. But in doing so, um, it can, they can produce damage. So this is uh, ionizing radiation can be hazardous to your health. And when the radiation strikes the tissue, there is ionization that can produce cellular, cellular damage. We have here four different pictures of the same object at different um, frequencies. This is how it looks through a normal telescope in the visible. But if we see it in, the, in radio, we can see something totally different. Instead of seeing something aligned in this direction, we see something 
sideways in the opposite direction, which means uh, radio waves means that this is coming from uh, gas that is uh, coming from this uh, galaxy, the galaxy uh, Sen A. And in the infrared, we're going to see also motion produced by molecules here. In X-rays, we're going to see a lot of um, uh, radiation coming from the nucleus of this uh, galaxy. And all of that comes because of the high concentration of mass that is uh, colliding, produce, uh, is producing collisions between particles. They produce uh, the radiation, the X-ray radiation. And this is uh, the end of the section. Um, we have uh, homework, we have two conceptual questions and two more problems.